uh, slash evening slash morning. Um, there are uh, still, we still have a few more people expected, but I imagine they'll trickle in and uh, we should get ourselves going so as to end in a reasonable time. Uh, my name is Evan Rosevere. Uh, I am a postdoctoral fellow here at the University of Hong Kong in the Faculty of Law um, and also affiliated with the Center for Comparative and Public Law, who is hosting this event which is a book talk for Alexander Hudson's uh, The Veil of Participation. Um, I would welcome uh, Dr. Hudson here. Uh, if you could just uh, say, say hello. Yeah, hello everyone, delighted to be here. All right, so uh, Dr. Hudson, <laughs> Dr. Hudson, sorry, uh, is a, currently a democratic assessment specialist at the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance. Uh, he's published widely on the subject of constitution making and constitutional matters more broadly. Um, that includes articles in comparative politics, electoral studies, um, and political research quarterly. Uh, he received his PhD a few years ago uh, in government from the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, prior to his current appointment, he was a postdoctoral research fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Religious and Ethnic Diversity. Um, we'll be getting to Alex in just a moment or two. He'll be talking for about 25 minutes, uh, laying out the, the groundwork of his arguments. Um, and after that, we will hear from Dr. Dinesha Simararatna. Uh, who is a senior lecturer in the Faculty of Law at the University of Colombo. Um, her research interests include public participation in constitution making and the judicial enforcement of economic and social rights. Um, she has published widely, including in uh, Disability, Disability and Society, the Journal of Law and Society, uh, and the Asian Journal of Comparative Law. She's also authored a number of technical and policy papers, and I believe recently co-edited a volume called uh, or entitled Women with Disabilities as Agents of Peace, Change and Rights, published by Rutledge. Uh, she holds a PhD from the University of Colombo, an LLM from Harvard, um, and has been admitted and enrolled as an attorney at law by the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka. Um, after Alex's presentation, again, we'll hear 10 to 15 minutes from Dr. Samara Ratna. Um, and without further ado, um, actually with one piece of further ado, um, we are running this in a webinar format, so any of you who do have questions, please feel free at any time to type them into the Q&A dialogue. Uh, the chat function is not functional for this uh, purpose, but please do at any time go through the Q&A. Uh, I'll tally them up, perhaps try and bring, bring some of them together, and we'll go right into a Q&A session at the end of the discussants' comments. So without now, now without further ado, Dr. Hudson. Well, uh, thanks very much for the introductions and thanks to the Center for Comparative and Public Law for hosting, uh, to Dr. Rosevere for the uh, the invitation. And uh, thanks also to uh, Dr. Sama Maratna for uh, uh, reading the book and agreeing to comment on it. And I look forward to, uh, to hearing what you think uh, shortly. I should also add a, just a very quick disclaimer that I speak as a, as a scholar and not as a representative of international idea. Uh, I, I would hope that they would endorse my work, but uh, that's not, you know, I, I did this research before I, I started that position. So um, just to put that on the table. And uh, now I will share some slides and I'm going to go <laughs> very quickly uh, can you just, uh, Evan, let me know you're receiving the slides? Yep, good. Okay. So I'm going to go, as I said, very quickly, but I'm happy to uh, go back to things uh, later on. So, uh, and just to note on the cover, uh, since uh, Evan's here, uh, I actually took this photo after Evan and I had hiked up Table Mountain, and uh, we were sort of watching the clouds come in and it and when I was trying to think of a, a title for the book and a cover image it kind of reminded me of the way the clouds veil Table Mountain at certain times. Anyway, uh, so the outline for the talk, uh, I'm going to give you just a couple slides on, on the motivation for the project, then I'll uh, discuss the research questions, some of the case studies, a little bit of the data, then I'll get to the key theoretical claims and I'll finish on policy implications, which only got 
I don't know, five pages in the book, but uh, these days strike me as being one of the most important parts. Um, so we'll, we'll end there. So this sort of area of research kind of begins for me with uh, these first words of the US Constitution, we the people of the United States. And it, you know, it was a very um, symbolic thing to do to write it that way, we the people, and it turns out it's highly influential. So in whatever language uh, constitutions have been written, if you translate them to English, 71 constitutions that are currently in force begin with the words, we the people, whereas only 10 begin with the more honest invocation, we the representatives of the people. But it is the case today that if one was drafting a new constitution, uh, the people would be involved. So uh, Vivian Hart wrote uh, some 18 years ago, uh, a democratic constitution is no longer simply one that establishes democratic governance. It is also a constitution that is made in a democratic process. And even more pointedly, Murray a few years ago wrote that it's inconceivable that a government would attempt to draft a new constitution without at least a nominal, nominal commitment to a process in which the public is consulted. And I think for, for all of you who are observing different constitution making processes around the world today, uh, this probably rings true that it's inconceivable that you would try to write a constitution without at least some commitment to public involvement. Uh, a number of benefits of participation have been put forward. Um, and I'm not going to read all of these, but I'll just focus on the Dan et al. Uh, piece from 2011, where they suggest that under certain conditions, at least, Public participation can improve national unity, lead to legitimacy and acceptance, inclusiveness, innovation, and civic education. So in the ideal case, this is what one might hope for from, from participation. Um, and of course, constitution writing is a, is a, a matter of immense normative significance, uh, both because of when it happens, often in a, in a moment of transition, uh, and also because it's, it, the process of writing the constitution may itself set precedents for the political processes that will exist under the new constitution. And of course, uh, as lawyers, I'm sure it's obvious the text itself is a precondition for lots of other things that we care about. Um, there has been a decent amount of work on public participation in constitution making over the last 10 years in particular. And a lot of the early empirical work focused on whether or not more participation in the drafting process would lead to better democratic performance in, in later years. And so using uh, sort of mixed methods and qualitative analysis, both Wheatley and Hermann and Sati uh, argued that participation is not associated with better democratic performance. But then in both an APSR article in the Cambridge University Press book, Eisenstadt, Levan and Mabuti have argued that participation is associated with better democratic performance uh, five and 10 years after ratification. Uh, using uh, uh, their own large data set, I should add, of, of uh, constitution making processes. Um, getting a little bit more into the details, Mabudi and Nadi have argued that uh, participation is more likely to lead to changes in the text when there's cohesion among the elite. Uh, and some of Mabudi's more recent work also deals a lot with inclusiveness in the uh, drafting body. But of course, each case has its own myths and official histories. So. Uh, you know, when you start to do more qualitative analysis, uh, it becomes uh, more nuanced, I think. Um, so the research questions that I set out with now some years ago uh, were first, to what extent does public participation have an impact on the content of the constitution? And secondly, what political factors determine the strength of this impact? So how can we explain variation? Uh, and then thirdly, what aspects of the constitution are more open to public input? And I would add a note here that these are all upstream questions. Um, and I've considered the downstream parts of the process and other work. So I'm not in this book concerned very much with referendums and things of this nature. But uh, as Evan mentioned, I've, I've worked on that in other places. So the, the case selection uh, began essentially with Brazil and South Africa which struck me as a, as a good pair of cases because the forms of participation were very similar uh, and the political parties were quite different. Um, I'd also done some work on Iceland earlier and as I was writing the book it became apparent that 
as incomparable as Iceland is in many ways, it's useful to have an example of a case where a constitution was actually drafted without the involvement of political parties at all. Uh, there are precious few of those. And so Iceland is instructive in that way, even though in other ways, there's little comparison that can be made between a country like Brazil and a country like Iceland. So uh, getting into sort of the substance of it now, um, to remind ourselves of the context in which these constitutions were written. So in Brazil, uh, in the, the mid 1980s, you have these massive protests, which were uh, initially targeted towards ending the military dictatorship and then having direct election of the president, which were unsuccessful, but they created these sort of communities of public participation, repertoires of collective action uh, that persisted during the constitution making process. And of course, we're all familiar with uh, the protests and the democratic movements to end apartheid in South Africa in the late 80s and early 90s. But of course, the constitution is not drafted by uh, mass public in the streets. It's in the end drafted by politicians usually in a constituent assembly. So here's an image of uh, the National Constituent Assembly in Brasilia in 1986. Um, and so one might wonder how much time and effort are these representatives willing to put into reading submissions from the public? Uh, particularly in cases like Brazil and South Africa where you have the uh, normally constituted legislature also sitting as the constituent assembly. So on top of all their normal legislative work, constituency service, et cetera, they're also drafting a constitution. So how much time and effort are they willing to put into actually consuming the inputs from the public? And then secondly, and perhaps more importantly, how open are their parties to having their positions informed by these additional inputs from members of the public? It turns out that they claim they're very open to this. So um, I'll just show you a few things, uh, images that I didn't put into the book, but I find really quite fascinating. So um, this is an example of, of a postcard type of uh, paper, about half of an A4 sheet that would have been left at um, post offices across Brazil in uh, about 1985. And uh, there's some wonderful uh, language here on the right, encouraging people to participate says that, that you also make uh, the new constitution, you also are a member of the constituent assembly, participate, and lots of uh, wonderful description here about how the constitution making process is an important moment in the history of the country and of all democratic nations and things like this. But this is, this is sort of making some implicit promises that you're also a member of the constituent assembly and that you should participate. Um, and some of the data were really fascinating from this. Um, and I touch on this in the chapter on Brazil in the book, but uh, people indicated a number of, uh, of things about their demographic situation here, their name and address, and then they would write down uh, what they wanted the constitution to say in this, this large text box. And uh, in what I think was a remarkable feat of 1980s computer science, all of this information was put into a massive database and those comments were transcribed uh, and are accessible to us today uh, to, uh, to, to analyze the text. And they produced these massive books of uh, sort of cross tabs of what different people in different parts of the country wanted. So there's uh, two interesting things to draw from this. First, that the drafters in Brazil are making some pretty impressive promises. And secondly, that their technical staff made a really significant effort uh, to make those inputs useful. This is one of my favorite sort of archive finds um, is one of my favorite ads from, uh, from a constitution making process, uh, which is of course Nelson Mandela on a pavement speaking on a, a mobile phone, which was exciting technology in, in 1995. Uh, and he says, hello, is that the, the constitutional talk line? I would like to make my submission. And at the bottom is the phone number that one could have called uh, to speak to an operator who would write down what you wanted the constitution to say. Um, and this one as an empirical social scientist is just beautiful um, because it's making a, 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 a testable promise. Uh, they say you've made your mark referring to the 1994 election. You've had your say, uh, perhaps through the phone line that Nelson Mandela was advertising. And it says, now we're making sure it counts. And you know, right now we members of the Con Constitutional Assembly are analyzing and discussing the nearly 2 million submissions and petitions, et cetera, et cetera. And so they're saying, you know, quite clearly, uh, you've said to us what the constitution should do and we're making sure that your inputs are, are having an impact. And um, 
it was uh, just a couple more images here of, of things, uh, uh, methods of participation. So here's a, a pre-printed form that people could write in. Um, here's uh, an image of one of the books that was provided to drafters in South Africa. On the left is the transcript of a, of a call to that um, talk line that Nelson Mandela was advertising. On the right, handwritten letter in Afrikaans, um, which was transcribed and translated into English uh, and produces interesting textual data for us today. But of course, you end up with massive stacks of paper. There's interesting accounts of, of boxes of petitions arriving in a taxi to the Con Constitutional Assembly in Brasilia and things. And uh, you know, one of the drafters in South Africa described it to me be, as being festooned with paper. So they have masses of information to deal with, uh, less so in Iceland, of course, uh, but uh, compared to the population of the country actually uh, the most but 72,000 written submissions in Brazil and 15,000 in South Africa. Uh, we'll come to in a second, the fact that uh, in South Africa, the number is usually reported as being something close to 2 million, but that includes signatures on petitions. So there are only 15,000 uh, written comments. And as we think about the impact that all these submissions might have on the development of the text, you can look for indirect impacts in terms of agenda setting or direct impacts that would be discrete changes in the text that respond to an input uh, from the public. Um, and I'm gonna go quickly through these next parts about the evidence, because it's sort of difficult to summarize in, in a few minutes. Um, but we could look at the textual data that I've already described through um, topic models, uh, through pattern matching, and then we can use more qualitative methods through interviews and analyzing transcripts and memoirs, et cetera. So, as I said very briefly, topic models basically indicate the extent to which documents talk about the same things or what they're about. And if you run uh, topic models over each of the uh, corpuses of uh, submissions from the public, you can derive the things that the people were talking about. And basically, I'm going to summarize this and say that in Iceland, there's a pretty high level of correspondence between what people were talking about and what the constitution talks about uh, some correspondence in Brazil and less so in South Africa. Uh, there's also pattern matching to look for direct impacts. It's essentially like plagiarism analysis, if you've ever used that in, in your teaching. Uh, we're matching text strings between inputs and outputs, and I find six matches in Brazil and 189 in South Africa. And then I did actual hand coding in, in Iceland uh, through a number of iterations, different drafts of the text because it, it was manageable at that level. Um, just to show you what that looks like, we have uh, on the left the text from a member of the public and on the right uh, the final constitutional text and you can clearly see what is the same, but it turns out that uh, it's copied from the interim constitution. So the, the reason that there is correspondence or matching text between the comment from the public and the final text is because they quoted uh, part of, of this section 182. And it, in some sense, is the kind of feedback that you might like as an academic author and saying, you know, this is what you wrote and this is how I think you should rephrase it. But it turns out that constitution drafters don't work that way. And the matches are all spurious. It's always the case that if there's matching text, in these cases at least, uh, it's a quotation from a draft. So we don't see direct impacts of that sort. Um, and just briefly on, on Iceland, as I said, I could do a manual analysis there. And I find that 29 of the 311 submissions from the public there pass what's called a smoking gun test. So you have you know, evidence that, uh, that an action was taken and you have evidence of an outcome, but you cannot observe uh, the connection between the two, but the timing, et cetera, gives you a certain degree of confidence uh, that the two things are related. And so I would submit to you that uh, about 9% of the submissions in Iceland are, led to a change in the text. There's another method of direct impact through petitions and popular amendments. So in uh, Brazil, uh, there was this interesting innovation for popular amendments that I, I can't describe in much detail now, but essentially it was a process through which um, civil society organizations could produce a piece of constitutional text or an amendment to a piece of constitutional text that they wanted to see implemented and uh, demonstrate popular support through that, through collecting signatures and endorsements and actually have that voted on in the constituent assembly. Uh, 82 of these 
uh, reached a vote uh, in the Constitutional Assembly, 19 were successful, and 62 individual demands were adopted in the final text. Um, and most of those deal with rights, especially regarding the family and labor rights. You can compare that somewhat to the petition system in South Africa, where, uh, as, as is mentioned, uh, about 1.7 million signatures on petitions, but there was no systematic procedure for handling petitions. Uh, it's interesting to me, at least, that they were mainly conservative in content, uh, and they were, for the most part, ignored. And to the extent that they were sort of successful, uh, for example, in including Afrikaans as an official language, it may be incidental in the sense that that was probably going to happen regardless of the content of the petition. Um, I also did uh, 57 semi-structured interviews uh, in person in Brazil, South Africa, and Iceland, and analyzed, of course, hundreds of pages of transcripts and, and found strikingly different narratives. Um, and I can't uh, really read through these in the time that we have, but I would encourage you to pick up the book and, and find them there. Um, so this is a member of an opposition party in South Africa speaking to me a few years ago. You do get a lot of single issue lunatics and the brutal truth is that if you're not Desmond Tutu, you're probably not going to be heard uh, as an individual. Um, which compares with what was said uh, in, in one of the meetings of the uh, Commission on Human Rights in um, the Brazilian Constituent Assembly, where uh, Lissanias Maciel says that proposals written on bread packaging paper were forwarded to the subcommittee and taken advantage of. So the most humble forms of participation, he says, were important to them. Um, and a member of the ANC speaking in one of the, the final debates on, uh, on adopting the text in South Africa says that, you know, basically they didn't think that the role of, of the drafter was to make sure that everything found its way into the text, but rather that as a, as a member of a political party or representative of the people, they should weigh these inputs along with others uh, and see what should go into the text. Um, compared again uh, with Brazil, where, where one of the drafters told me that what they had during the Constitutional Assembly was a nearly permanent dialogue with society with many meetings and hearings to make the Constitution compatible with what Brazilians hoped for in that new political moment. Now, of course, this should be taken with a, a pinch of salt in the sense that this is one of those myths of that case, I think, but, but it also is interesting the way that uh, there was this difference in how Brazilian and South African uh, politicians spoke of what they did. Um, and just one quote from Iceland, um, where uh, the drafting process was essentially online and open, um, and all the inputs came through the, the Constitutional Assembly's own a website. And uh, so this drafter told me uh, we were really scared when we did it at first because we thought this is the internet. People are going to lash out. They're going to be really rude. But the actual reality was that people were really nice, polite, clever, helpful, and brilliant. Um, so to summarize the impacts, uh, in Iceland, uh, as I said, there are 25, 29 uh, uh, identifiable changes to the constitution in response to popular input. So close to 10%. And you have this narrative of learning from the public. In Brazil, at least 11 articles of the constitution reflect specific popular input. So 62 discrete changes and you have this narrative of mass elite engagement. And in South Africa, actually only one article can be demonstrated to have changed due to popular input. And it's the addition of one word degradation referring to um, uh, harms to the rights of the child in Article 28, and you have this narrative of inter-elite negotiation, which I haven't discussed very much, but uh, the channel between the ANC and the National Party with Wolf Meyer and Cyril Ramaphosa uh, was, was sort of the key to, to much of the constitutional text. So why, why this difference? In each of these cases, we have innovative forms of participation. You have moments of profound political transition and an apparent commitment from drafters to participation. And the explanation I offer in the book is that it's related to the political parties and that there is significant variation, uh, particularly with regard to party strength between the political parties in South Africa and Brazil. And of course, in Iceland, you have um, an absent uh, political party. Uh, as I understand it, party strength has two core attributes, legislative discipline and programmatic commitments. Um, just briefly in Brazil, uh, the PMA de Bay, the sort of uh, main opposition party during the military opposition or the successor to it, 
uh, actually had a majority of the seats in the Constitutional Assembly and could essentially have passed the Constitution on its own if it had been organized as such. Whereas in South Africa, the ANC was just short of the two thirds majority required uh, to pass the Constitution. Um, and uh, I'm going to skip over this uh, content relatively quickly, but um, basically Brazil's constant uh, political parties are, are notoriously weak and disorganized to this day and this procedural constitution, the Centron, was uh, important in passing the constitution and remains important in Brazilian politics today. Uh, and I, my argument is that this lack of party organization left space for effective public input. The fact that the parties didn't have commitments uh, within themselves about what the constitution should say, um, and the fact that they were not organized in the drafting body uh, left both procedural space and sort of ideological space for new ideas to enter uh, the drafting. Uh, whereas in South Africa, you have two highly organized and disciplined parties in the National Party and the ANC. Uh, and in the end, the core aspects of the constitution were negotiated between a very small group of representatives. Uh, and the constitution was approved almost unanimously in the end, which I think reflects the success of those negotiations. So uh, for the typology of impacts, we could say that in Brazil, you have strong parties and low impact, uh, sorry, South Africa, strong parties, low impact, Brazil, weak parties, medium impact, Iceland, absent parties and high impact. I'm not really committed to these words over here, but um, uh, we can discuss that. Um, just briefly, um, in the sixth chapter of the book, I do uh, expand the analysis beyond these three cases to discuss uh, a statistical analysis uh, across a couple hundred cases and then also have 16 more uh, small case studies. Um, and the difficulty there is that we uh, have some data on the level of participation in constitution making processes, but the measurement of impact is very difficult. So uh, we essentially have to use a, a proxy measure for the impact of public participation. And it, it's helpful here that one of my secondary findings and one that's also been commented on by others, including uh, David Law and Milo Versteeg, is that you know, rights have this sort of ratchet-like quality where they're, they're much, much of the um, action and rights in constitution drafting is additive. And it turns out that uh, novel rights uh, that is to say, ones that are uncommon across constitutions are can be, in my argument at least, uh, a good proxy for the impact of participation. And this comes uh, through from the analysis of the three cases in particular. Uh, and so I've done a number of linear regressions uh, trying to use uh, the number of novel rights as a proxy for the impact of participation. Um, and participation is, is uh, sort of always positive. Party strength is a little bit ambiguous and the interaction between participation and political party strength um, is, is negative and significant when we include relevant controls. Uh, the interpretation of that uh, is best done by comparing uh, the effect of party strength at the mean of that measure at one standard deviation above it and at one standard deviation below it. So, at the mean level of party strength, increasing participation increases the number of novel rights. But if we go one standard deviation below the mean in party strength, that is extremely weak parties, the slope is, is much uh, stronger. So we have many more or several more rights being added as the level of participation increases. Whereas uh, stronger parties, one standard deviation above the mean actually has a negative slope, weakly negative. Uh, and so I take this uh, as, as strong support for the argument that party strength is an important mediating factor in the effectiveness of public participation on constitutional texts. Um, wrapping up the central claims, uh, participation is unlikely to make a difference to core aspects of the, of the constitution, by which I mean the, the political institutions. Um, maybe that's inelegantly worded because you might argue that rights are a core aspect of a constitution, but, but I should say I mean political institutions. Um, and I would argue that public input sometimes has an impact on less contentious aspects of the text, in particular in adding new rights, uh, and that party strength is the key explanatory variable, and both attention and impact are centered on rights. So the policy implications. Um, 
I think it's important to consider what the desiderata of participation really are. Is participation added to a constitution drafting process to legitimate the text or to improve the text? Is it the case that drafters want new information about what the people want the constitution to say? Or do they have some belief in, in sort of the epistemic value of hearing from the people that you're more likely to come to the correct answer if you have more voices involved in the decision-making process? Uh, you know, or is it sort of some sort of cynical uh, legitimation of an elite pact? I think also then the, the planning and budget for analysis of the impact from the, uh, for, if the input from the public is really important. If you want to do something uh, really robust as they did in Brazil, this takes a lot of time and money and highly trained personnel. Um, one could add to that story also the time uh, and money that it takes to go out and visit people uh, in villages and rural areas, if that's, if that's the context that one is working in. Um, and then I think we also have to have a little bit of humility and understand participation's potential with reference to the larger political context. It's unlikely to make major differences to the, sort of the practice of politics. Uh, with that, I think politicians need to be careful not to overpromise. Uh, but maybe that's just my own sort of personal take on it that you shouldn't say we're making sure it counts if, if you're not doing that. But um, thank you very much uh, for, for your kind attention and uh, for this opportunity to discuss the book. And I look forward to hearing what uh, Dr. Sama Maratna uh, has to say. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Um, very interesting things um, and an e excellent book. Um, we will turn things over to De uh, sorry, Dr. Samaratne, Samara Ratne, um, shortly. I'm, I'm sorry, I've, I've made a thing about it and now I'm just messing it up. Um, but I will mention again um, that if you do have any questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A and we'll get that going right after the discussion finishes. Without further ado. Thank you, Evan, and thank you, uh, Alex, for that uh, uh, introduction and overview of the book. Um, let me also begin by thanking the Center for Comparative and Public Law for inviting me to offer my response to this book. Uh, when this book came out and the ISEL blog carried an interview, I made a note to read it and then uh, couldn't come back to it. So when Evan sent me this invitation, I knew that this was my moment to study the book. And I appreciated the opportunity very much. And I'll try to explain why I say this uh, in my brief remarks today. Alex, congratulations. Uh, as I mentioned before we began the webinar, I do find this book to be uh, a solid treatment of certain questions about public participation, um, which uh, needed to be said. And you say it in the most uh, robust and disciplined way. So congratulations for the, on the book. Uh, it's an honest inquiry, which is uh, what was most refreshing about it. So I have organized my remarks uh, under six points, and I'll take you through them in the next uh, few minutes. I'll describe the gap, which I think Alex is responding to. In my own words, I will also summarize his main claim, although he's already introduced us to that now. And I also want to make several observations on the methods that Alex employs in establishing this claim because I found that to be quite striking as well. Uh, and then fourthly, I respond more generally to his main claim uh, and then build on that to also suggest some uh, theoretical uh, implications of your argument. And finally, present to you my own response to how we think we should uh, deal with the sticky issue of public participation in constitution making. So first of all, what problems in public participation in constitution making does this book respond to? Recently, I was a signatory to a public statement that was issued in Sri Lanka by several academics and professionals. Clause three of that statement reads as follows, and I quote, Constitution making is a challenging task, ensuring effective public participation and consultation that goes beyond the box ticking exercise is challenging, yet necessary. Some aspects of constitutional reform will be the subject of contentious political negotiation and bargaining. 
even the best of efforts made in good faith often yield unsatisfactory results. Nevertheless, elected representatives of the people are duty bound to consult the public who give them a mandate to draft and authorize a new constitution and therefore engage them in this process to ensure that their views are also counted. In any event, a process that involves no consultation or transparency is not acceptable within a democratic society." End quote. In Sri Lanka, where I am now, a committee of experts appointed by the cabinet is currently drafting a new constitution for the country. This committee received submissions for a few months earlier this year from the public. The statement that I quoted from was issued due to concerns among other things about the non-participatory nature of the drafting post process and the lack of transparency. The statement called for among other things, and I quote again, to design a process whereby the public may respond to the draft and provide inputs, end quote. Now this anecdote is illustrative of the problem that Alex confronts in this book, public participation in constitution making has been practiced across the globe in a variety of jurisdictions and in varied contexts. The desirability of public participation is considered to be a settled question in constitutional scholarship as well as in constitutional practice. Public participation is accepted in the abstract as a normative claim, as doctrine, and I think it's fair to say that it is considered to be an essential component of any constitution making today as Alex has already pointed out. The emphasis on public participation in the UNDP guidance note on constitution making support 2014 is but an example. Now, one aspect remains notably opaque in this debate. At the level of theory or at the levels of theory, doctrine and of practice, what is the actual impact of public participation in constitution making? In a sea of literature that praises the normative or doctrinal dimensions of public participation, this question is in many ways, the proverbial elephant in the room. And this is the question that Alex concerns himself in this book. The book explores this question carefully and offers an account that compels us to lift the veil of public participation and see it for what it really is, a cover. He compels us, uh, to return to the drawing board on public participation in constitution making. In doing so, he adds his scholarly voice to that of scholars such as Amrat Sati, who he also referred to, who have raised similar questions about the impact of public participation in constitution making. So this brings me to my second set of remarks. Alex's response to this question is his thesis on party mediation. Using an impressively detailed and diverse evidence base, Alex argues that when you look beyond the veil of public participation, you can see that the strength of pub political parties is a critical factor in this process. And I quote his own summary of his thesis, stronger parties are like, less likely to include input from the public in the constitutions that they produce, while weak parties are more exposed to public pressure and thus include more content from the public. And I quote again, this party mediation thesis suggests that the other variables at work here interact with party strength in such a way that strong parties essentially preclude significant influence from individuals in the constitution making process and significantly lessen the influence of interest groups in the later stages of the process, end quote. This insight speaks to what I think is a prominent gap in our existing knowledge on the relevance of public participation. The gap is between the normative doctrinal and the theoretical on the one hand and practice effect outcome and tools of measurements on the other. In speaking to this gap, Alex also adds to existing knowledge on the relevance of political parties, specifically on constitutional making and more broadly on constitutional democracies. This intervention therefore, complements the renewed interest and study of political parties today in constitutional law. So my third set of remarks is on how Alex establishes this unique and timely thesis. Alex's methods are to me as significant and as unique as his claim. He demonstrates a mastery of a rare combination of skills in our field. First, he engages in an in-depth study of public participation in three jurisdictions, South Africa, Brazil, and in Iceland. These in-depth studies involve a critical reading of existing literature, interpretation of a number of submissions, and interviews. This approach enables Alex to establish his thesis in a robust way. 
In other words, he triangulates his fieldwork. This in-depth study of three jurisdictions is followed by an overview of another 16 case studies, um, which is then followed by a statistical analysis of public participation in constitution making in successful projects between 1974 and 2014. Now, I read this effort as an attempt to come at the same research question from three different angles, and the result is all the more convincing and well-established and stable because of his approach. Alex's ability to switch between what we traditionally describe as qualitative and quantitative is impressive. Many scholars in constitutional law, including myself, are challenged by the need to engage in research that is beyond the analytical and doctrinal. Alex, on the other hand, offers not just field-based research, but field-based research that sits well across the qualitative and quantitative divide as well. As a result, you have set a high standard for us to aspire to. So this takes me to um, the insights that we can gain from your impressively wide-ranging study of the role of political parties in pub and public participation in constitution making. So what insights can we gain from the party mediation thesis? The veil of participation uh, leaves its author, its readers with an inconvenient but and uncomfortable truth that public participation does not actually result in substantive constitution making, particularly in political context where political parties are strong. As Alex points out in his chapter on South Africa, this is not new knowledge to those who were heavily involved in negotiating and drafting the South African constitution. Where political parties are weak, they may be open to public influence, but the likelihood of that constitution making exercise succeeding, its durability, etc., is in doubt. So where does this leave us who are advocates of public participation in constitution making? Will this thesis further encourage a checklist approach to public participation in constitution making? Will it add to public apathy towards constitutional moments? So this takes me to my fifth set of remarks. Of the several implications of this book, I will highlight three. One is the theoretical. Alex's case studies and statistical analysis presents a strong evidence base, which will allow scholars to review and rethink the concept of constituent power in constitutional law. While the theoretical debates on constituent and constituent, constituted power are fascinating and rich, Alex's account is a much needed reminder that it is not an idea that maps on to reality. Now, my current thinking is that the theories on constituent power mistakenly centers human agency as the gravitational force of constitutional law. I wonder whether the field is in need of a Copernicus moment, one where we realize that the sun does not revolve around the earth, but rather the earth around the sun. In this regard, perhaps non-mainstream worldviews such as Buddhist constitutionalism might have something to offer to the world of constitutional theory. The French and American revolutions generated and shaped the debates on constituent power even today and are heavily focused on collective human agency. But perhaps as Alex shows us, that primary focus is misplaced. Moreover, other work on constitution making shows us that multiple factors beyond public participation have a strong influence on constitution making, international approval being just one factor. I will wrap up quickly, Evan, in case you're watching the time. The second is in relation to constitution making in post-war context, a topic of concern for me. The party mediation thesis should give us pause in post-war context. In my own context, this is extremely topical. The Sri Lankan government at the moment has nearly two thirds power in parliament. The political party in power has consolidated its authority and is currently engaged in drafting a constitution, as I mentioned, through a committee of experts. Alex's work reminds us that in this scenario, Opportunity for meaning public participation is very low and therefore has to be rethought in imaginative ways. The third point and one I will only mention briefly is that Alex's work helps us to reinterpret history on constitution making and perhaps revisit history. More honestly, his thesis could potentially be extended to reviewing existing accounts of historical processes across a range of instances, including post-war, post-independence, etc. Now, finally, in his concluding chapter, Alex offers some guidance on how we can avoid the pitfalls that he warns us about. <clears throat> he, 
He suggests that constitution makers who include a procedure for public participation must anticipate and prepare to receive significant volumes of submissions, be honest in how the public participation exercise is pitched and promoted, and have more modest and realistic expectations of the kind of transformation that can be achieved. I think it is fitting and commendable that Alex ends this stimulating book with a call to humility uh, as follows, and I quote very quickly, we seek to engineer various aspects of the process, tinkering with mechanisms of consultation and new technologies for public input, while the larger political foundations on which these structures are built persist unchanged. No amount of finessing the proportions of the windows will alter the political and economic foundations of the edifice. This striking quote brings me to my final point. Elsewhere, in an article that is currently under review, I argue that public participation in post-war context illustrates a broader truth. I argue that public participation is not about providing input to the drafting of that constitution alone. Rather, if done well, public participation at a time of constitution drafting will facilitate, create, support the platform for the ongoing state formation project. It will help us to see the edifice, debate about it, and aspire to better it. It can become an elevated moment in time where the public can engage in discussion and debate on questions about political rights, identity, etc. Done well, such an exercise might result in the public failing to support a new constitution, generate high levels of disappointment. It might even add to social unrest and political disenchantment. Needless to say, we scholars of constitutional law perhaps are not ready to deal with such outcomes. Alex's point, therefore, that a focus on public participation is misplaced when the edifice itself requires transformation is indeed an uncomfortable and inconvenient truth. In conclusion, I let me repeat my endorsement of this excellent book. My only criti critical comment of the book is that it seems to me that it undersells its theoretical potency. I think, Alex, you mentioned this as well. In the second chapter, you offer a strong explanation as to how you interpret the terms that you use and explain clearly what you mean by strong and weak political parties. Now, I was looking forward to a similar analysis of the implications of your party mediation thesis in your final chapter. I felt that there is a shift to a broader discussion in the final chapter. As a result, I felt that the specific insights from the party mediation thesis are underexplored in that chapter, but that does not take away from the provocation that is presented in this book. So thank you very much, Alex. And thank you, Evan, for the opportunity. And thank you very much, Dinesha, for your excellent comments. Um, I think now I'll briefly refer things back to Dr. Hudson uh, for his comments on the comments. Um, and I have one or two things I would like to get in myself using chair's prerogative, and then we'll turn to the, to the Q&A. So please do feel free to continue sending in questions. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Samamaratna, for your for your comments. Um, very very generous reading of my book, and I'm glad that it, I would say I'm particularly pleased to hear that it's been useful already uh, for you as you think about the constitutional process in Sri Lanka. Um, I I don't want to take too much time to respond, uh, but um, you know I think <laughs> the the thing that strikes me is really interesting is your, your last couple of comments, uh, particularly as it re relates to your own work about state formation. And maybe I would uh, add to that, that there, I suppose there could be a potential for public participation to contribute to creative destruction, if you will, in terms of breaking down myths and, and uh, maybe the sort of political self-image to understand where, what the stat, status of the political community really is. Um, so I look forward to reading your article. Um, yeah, uh, and thanks for your note on, on chapter six. Uh, and, and yeah, um, you know, maybe there's room for a follow-up that will uh, better explain uh, the full implications of it. Um, uh, it was an interesting time finishing the book. It was sort of, um, the, sub, the first summer of the pandemic, and um, and uh, so it was was a uh, you know somebody else read the book and commented that it it seemed to start out hopeful about participation and get sort of more pessimistic as the book went on. <laughs> I don't know if that's related. 
but anyway, yeah, so thank you so much for your comments and I, I look forward to, uh, to, to seeing um, uh, your, your work that's coming forward, forthcoming work, I should say. All right, uh, excellent, thank you very much. Um, so I have two related question comments that I, that I assure you are intended as questions and not me inserting my opinion. Um, so one thing that really struck me when you were talking about the Brazilian case was the, the reference to uh, comments on bread wrappers. And the first thing that came to my mind there uh, was a, a, the sort of discussion of Colombian tutelas and tutelas being submitted on napkins and being considered by judges. So we have this, this sort of what you're presenting as a myth and what probably in fact is often a myth of all levels of society having this equal access to the, I don't know, the hallways or of power or the decision makers, right? Something like this traditional pluralist vision of, of political science um, or of politics, I should say. So we have, if we have participation on, on that side, um, but at the other, on the other hand, we have issues um, of say substantive expertise where th there are times when you, you don't want the public deciding, say, how to do an operation. Um, I mean, that's your most obvious example of this, but I think as scholars of constitutional law, um, of, of politics in general, we accept there are certain situations in where expert knowledge actually ought to be privileged over whatever popular opinion might be. Now, where that line needs to be drawn is, is somewhat problematic, um, but how do you see this playing out in the context of constitution making? Because I really think that this is, this is a, an important area where we do want to recognize um, that public participation and public input can have um, a certain cognitive dissonance to it in terms of what we want to achieve. So if we are looking at this, the importance of, of participation and its mediation through parties, do we actually have a legitimate role for parties to mediate this in a programmatic sense? And if so, how do we facilitate that in a good way rather than sort of a nefarious negotiated settlement type of way? Yeah, thanks for that comment. Um, I think that's a really interesting comparison between the tutelas and uh, the, the uh, submissions from the public about what the constitution should say. And I wanna draw a connection between those two and what, uh, what I've heard from uh, people who've been involved in drafting processes in uh, Zambia and Nepal in particular, uh, where the drafters would go to a village and there would be a meeting and people uh, you know, who live in that area would describe what their problems were and what they wanted the constitution to do without you know, having that expert knowledge of what constitutions in, pa in the past have said about various issues. And so what ends up happening is that the, the drafters have to do a sort of, uh, what we call it sort of a professional translation of the real world needs for let's say healthcare or a new bridge or school teachers and what the constitution should do about that. And I think that's where expertise and public input meet. And I also think that's where uh, you know, political parties have a role. And that, that's always been the role of political parties is to aggregate the interests of the public and turn them into policy outputs. Um, and so you know, uh, the strong parties kind of come off badly in some ways in this book, but I also mentioned in the last chapter that there's a, a possibility, perhaps a probability that strong parties produce better constitutions uh, in the sense that if they are effective uh, they do a good job of aggregating the interests of the public uh, better than these sort of uh, random inputs that, that one gets uh, from those who, for whatever reason, feel compelled to participate. Um, so I, I'm not suggesting that expert knowledge necessarily should be privileged, um, but that there can be, I hope, some sort of fruitful interaction between, uh, between expert understandings of, of how constitutions function and uh, the, you know, sometimes pressing and immediate severe needs of the people who participate in the drafting process.
We are, in fact, open on questions at the moment. Thank you. Uh, so I will actually uh, just pose a, a second one here, and I think it's, it's closely related. Um, if we are looking at participation um, along the same lines as, as mediating this, this expertise versus uh, normative judgment or cognitive normative distinction, um, if you want to think about it in policy terms, um, what role is there and how might we go about um, balancing, uh, I guess, balancing out the opportunities, the substantive opportunities for participation here? Um, so if we are thinking about, um, let's say, access to the Icelandic constitution making process, um, I was struck by, I think it was six PhDs, uh, several postgraduate degrees, most of them had written books on, on some, some aspect of Icelandic politics previously. Um, and while that may very well lead to a good constitution, it in no way leads to a constitution made by a demographically representative body of individuals. Um, so how do we balance out this, this, this sort of seeming contradiction? I think that's a really interesting and important question um, for many reasons, but one in particular is that there's a lot of interest these days in uh, improving the means of public participation in lots of different arenas. So, um, you know, participatory budgeting has been with us for a long time, but now there are citizens assemblies in uh, the, the German speaking area of Belgium, Ost Belgian. I think there's also a permanent one now in the city of Paris. And so there appears to be a lot more interest in involving, um, I should clarify, randomly selected assemblies of citizens in decision making processes. And I think that that has been taken up in some quarters uh, as, a, as an idea for constitution making that, you know, it might be good. Uh, and that was one of the things that they did in Iceland, actually, uh, twice to have a randomly selected group of around 1000 people. Uh, deliberate about what the constitution should say. And uh, I think there is some evidence to suggest that when you have that kind of um, deliberation informed sometimes by expert presentations, you can come up with interesting answers to constitutional questions. Uh, there's also good examples from Ireland that, that many people have written about as well. Um, so this is one model where you try and get a descriptively representative slice of the population rather than the self-interested individuals who for whatever reason choose themselves to participate who in most cases tend to be older male wealthier uh, more educated so it's not a representative um, uh, uh, group by any means so you have this sort of two two approaches there between randomly selecting and self-selecting um, and so it's, it's kind of an interesting moment, I think, in constitution making, uh, where if one was designing a process today, uh, you would probably uh, tend towards more random selection in the participation. Um, but it, it all comes back to the two things that I raise in the book. Um, one being what the, the, um, the desired outcome of participation is. And uh, the other being, you know, the real space in which the text can be changed. So on the one hand, if, if a drafter is genuinely curious about what uh, a randomly selected and then informed selection of the public would say, then it seems to me that random selection on a sort of deliberative poll type scenario could be quite valuable. Um, but that's not always the interest. Um, similarly, it has happened <laughs> uh, both that the uh, recommendations from the public are largely ignored. So even in the celebrated Irish case, only a few of the things that the Citizens Assembly had recommended were really carried forward into constitutional amendments. Um, and secondly, that uh, the public, the mass public, sometimes reject the views of the informed subset of the public. So this happened twice in Canada with electoral reform, where uh, a deliberative uh, assembly of randomly selected citizens chose what seemed to them to be the optimal solution that was then rejected by the mass public in a referendum. So uh, I think 
you know, to sort of summarize my rambling answer to you, uh, my, my takeaway is, is again, going back to that uh, quotation from the book that Dr. Sama Maratna uh, referenced in that, you know, we are spending a lot of time uh, thinking about the particular means of participation without giving a whole lot of attention to the, the real political institutional context in which the space uh, for, for public impact may be quite narrow. Thank you very much. Um, we are approaching end of time here. So I think in, in the absence of anything from the general audience, um, I'll turn it back to our two, uh, our two presenters for any closing comments they may wish to add, and perhaps we'll go in reverse order. Thanks, Evan. Um, so I did have a couple of further comments uh, in terms of um, uh, looking more specifically at your idea of the randomly selected participant and the self-selected participants. Um, like I said, my thinking on public participation comes from the post-war context of Sri Lanka. And there are the, the ethnically divided nature of society uh, intersects with this idea of self-selection and random selection in interesting ways. Um, so if I go back to how you present the participant in your book, I think you offer some detail, uh, but there is, I think, more that you can do with definitely with the data that you have identified for yourself in unpacking this further, because um, that kind of study would be very helpful in thinking about um, public participation differently in contexts such as Sri Lanka, where whether it's a randomly selected participant or whether it's a self-selected participant, uh, ethnic political identities um, can really uh, spin it in a way that uh, complicates many of the issues that you discuss in the book. Uh, so really this is an invitation for you to continue to do the excellent work that you're doing and give us more analysis of the type that you have offered in this book. Um, because at the moment, constitution in constitution making public participation kind of sits there, sometimes runs parallelly. Um, and it's not really seen as a particularly useful device other than for legitimation which you talk about in your book. Uh, but perhaps there is a need to think about the relationship between public participation, state formation and constitution making uh, differently. Thanks, Evan. Thank you very much. And uh, Alex? Yeah. Um... Thank you uh, again for raising something new. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen a whole lot of work actually on random selection in an ethnically divided post-conflict context. And I think that that is hugely challenging. Uh, it's something that we absolutely need to do research on uh, unless I'm missing something groundbreaking, uh, which could of course be the case. But, you know, I think that's, it's really quite interesting. Um, and uh, I probably don't have anything really intelligent to say about it at the moment. Um, but, you know, what strikes me is, is whether or not if you have uh, a selection process that focuses on some sort of ethnic equity, that you risk reifying the political significance of ethnicity, rather than pivoting to the issues that affect everyone. Um, so uh, yeah, this de deserves um, some consideration, particularly in, in the constitution making context. So thanks for raising that. Um, and uh, I think uh, there is one question uh, incoming, so I'll, I'll stop there. All right, so uh, we have our, our deputy director of the center uh, who would like to chime in with his two cents. And uh, I, I turn it over to you, Alex. 
I, yeah, I was just uh, inspired inspired to uh, intervene a bit on this issue of deeply divided or and or post conflict settings. So, I mean, in these in these places, the elite brokering uh, aspect of constitution making, I think, probably is especially uh, important because you need to make sure that there aren't uh, powerful spoiler groups that are left out of the settlement that the major uh, factions are are reasonably happy with whatever's uh, uh, hammered out, and that that sort of those imperatives are, I, I guess, kind of you know maybe at <clears throat> in a lot of tension with some of the more idealistic ideas about democratic participation. But I would say if you were to be difference blind in those contexts about who's going to participate in the constitution, it seems to me that that would be a real recipe for disaster. Um, so, I mean, you could say, yes, it, it sort of reifies uh, group differences to uh, in some way institutionalize them into the, into the constitution making uh, process. But if you don't do that, um, you probably don't get a peace agreement or a constitutional settlement at all. Um, and, and you certainly don't create those divisions by acknowledging them, acknowledging them or recognizing them in some way. I mean, it's not like um, these places aren't divided and then suddenly there's some sort of institutional recognition for group difference and they become divided. I mean, it's often the case that they're deeply divided for ages under under often difference blind majoritarian systems that happen to privilege one particular group over others. So uh, to then go and try to come up with a settlement for those problems that is itself difference blind. Uh, I mean, so, you know, you kind of randomly allocated this uh, a say in, 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 in the substance of the Northern Ireland peace agreement, for example, uh, I don't know if you would have got what you got, and I highly, I, I, I doubt that it, whatever would have come out of that would have um, managed to work. Uh, but, but you know, this is a this is a, an issue that people in Northern Ireland also disagree about in other places as well. So I, I don't have the last word on it, but I, I, I have, a, I have a, a view which I thought I'd, uh, I'd throw into the mix there. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, and if I can uh, send a quick heads up to our technical people here, um, I would like to thank everyone for their attendance, uh, as well as the Center for Comparative and Public Law for hosting this event, uh, Dr. Hudson for presenting, and Dr. Samara Ratne uh, for uh, agreeing to act as a discussant. Um, and I wish you all a good day. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Bye.